Um, hi, everyone. I'm Devin Waugh, the Instruction Librarian for NC Live, and this is the Welcoming Students and Families Back to the Library panel. Um, this was something that was proposed by um, library workers from around the state um, and brought up to our training advisory committee a few months ago. Um, I know that our public libraries around the state have really stepped up to support their local school districts, form partnerships for distance learning, um, and also have been kind of the guinea pigs with a lot of reopening plans in our state in the last year. Um, our panelists today, I wanna introduce them before we get started with the questions. Um, Amber Hargett is the head of youth services at Noose Regional Library in Kinston. Paige Anderson is the assistant director at Burke County Public Library in the western part of the state. Um, Tiffany Savage is the children's librarian at Samson Clinton Public Library System. Um, and Lindsay Skidmore is the um, digital learning and technology support specialist for Duplin County Schools. Um, and so we'll get started with the first question, um, which is for Amber, um, no, for Paige. Um, what successes have come from the virtual activities and programming that should be sustained? Hi, right, so we stepped back big time last March, of course, as everybody else did, but started back up, uh, allowing patrons back into the building um, in July. So we've had stuff going on pretty consistently um, since then, trying to balance in-person programs as well as virtual programs, take-home programs and stuff like that. And I think that's given us a good view of how things may be able to go forward and looking at numbers and statistics for what has worked the best as we've, we've done stuff. You know, we've been able to reach a community of people that we weren't able to before. Uh, parents of kids, uh, if the parents are working and they can't bring the kids in for programming when it's scheduled. People who are in uh, nursing homes or don't have transportation or don't come out due to medical conditions, um, stuff that was before or, or even more recent things. So being able to do curbside pickup to take things out of people's cars take home bags for crafts and the accompanying videos that go with those bags so that people can learn how to do it and even try to do it um, at home and not have to worry about other people watching them craft. Um, the Zoom, oh, sorry, of course that's gonna happen. The Zoom, um, Zoom calls um, that we were doing with the different kids, again, reaching people who aren't able to be here. And the last couple of months, we've done a really good job incorporating the Zoom with live programs for some hybrid programming so that we could have a group in the room, uh, like our teenagers could have everybody in the room who could come that night and then they're playing games on Jackbox and somebody couldn't make it or was sick or is unable to get a ride and they're able to log in from home and still join the fun and still talk with the people who are there and, and take part in the program. I think it's also forced us to use a lot of technology that was either on the back burner or we kind of had on our wish list for a while we wanted to do. So we finally got on Instagram. Obviously that's going to continue. You know, we've upped our Facebook stuff. Staff has had to learn how to use new technology, new um, videography skills, digital editing, stuff like that. That is definitely going to go forward um, as we do. We use a lot of that for videoing story times to post online and those story times did not work well. They've kind of crashed, uh, but we still have those skills to use for other things. We also, the team started a Discord server with the YA programmer. And so they've got their own server that we limit who's there. It is monitored so that they don't have to worry about ending up in a chat room with somebody they don't know. And parents feel a lot more comfortable with that. And it gives them a place to share pictures and their artwork and, and, and other things that they're doing and have a place that they can just kind of be. Um, we've kind of used a story time group as well on Facebook for that, for the parents. And we're going to start transitioning that into a little more of a place to post pictures and to connect and to look at resources and stuff. So I think, you know, the things like the trivia nights, the um, Jackbox game nights, the local history posts that we did on Facebook that we had never done before that have been huge um, are things that are definitely going to be able to, to go on going forward. With some of the other stuff that, you know, that we've, been, we've tried and just has failed, I think we're gonna roll that back and look at, look at other options. Thanks, Paige. I think it's really nice to see how social media has allowed so many different populations in your area to 
connect with each other um, and share resources and programming. It sounds like um, those accounts have really flourished in the last year. I think with more people using it stuck at home and people sharing posts from groups and businesses and stuff like that, we've been able to reach some people that may not have seen, even seen our Facebook page before this. Yeah, definitely. So our second question is, um, what practices have you adopted during the pandemic that you want to continue? And this is for Lindsay. Hello, everyone. I think the one thing that we can all say is that the pandemic has in, has taught us all that instruction can exceed the four walls of the classroom. Um, so for us at the public school level, thinking about those practices that we want to continue to use to allow learning to happen at all times and how we can expand those. Um, I think the partnerships between our public schools and our local libraries is going to be more needed than ever as we move forward um, because we're going to see learning gaps in our students in the classroom. So I really think um, it would be great for us to continue the public uh, school system. Or is we're going to still rely and need our local libraries to provide that safe internet access and device access for our students and our families. And even if we are face-to-face -face next year, that's still going to be a need. Um, teachers will continue to utilize learning management systems, and they'll continue to utilize the digital forms of communication that were put into place this year. And so it's going to be critical that our parents and students continue to have that access to the internet and are able to interact and engage with our schools and our teachers in that way. And the library system just provides a great opportunity for that. Um, I also think it's very important that we continue to work collaboratively in person or remotely with our library, our school teachers and our school library media coordinators. So having that partnership with our public libraries and our school libraries to help teachers with the research skills and the project-based learning activities that will be going on. Um, it's going to be a huge asset for us now that we've figured out the technology behind it and how we can connect in such a, a easy, simple, quick way. Um, I think this will help our teachers help with, uh, you know, address the learning gaps and to provide those uh, learning opportunities that are going to be needed to engage our students. Like Paige mentioned earlier, like the idea of curbside pickup for research materials or the craft bags to help with their projects that they may be doing in the classroom. Um, I just think we need to continue to think about those and how we can um, expand those as we go forward next year. And then I also think you know, just thinking about that love of reading, I think this year with um, all of the technology and um, the separation from school that our kids kind of lost, they got they got buried down into the content and maybe not explored their love of reading as much as needed. Um, so really thinking about how can we be creative to engage them in that and continue that. I've heard of some great creative remote book clubs and those kind of things that we want to continue to do with our kids to get them on board so that they find that love of reading. That's a really good point about kind of encouraging the reading for entertainment and not just for learning, um, which learning, you know, also should have some sort of fun element to it. But I think that that resource and that space for relaxation and comfort is really important with reading. Um, and, even, and even just the social emotional. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of impact that they've had. And so I think to me, literature and books are the greatest way to kind of reach and feel that need. And so I think it's going to be important that we're exposing our kids to literature that meets um, some of the struggles or talks to their, their realities and perspectives. Yeah, definitely. That has kind of um, a focus on, you know, the emotional challenges and social issues that they're facing right now. Um, in terms of technology, did you find that collaborating with your public library system helped with um, kind of increasing access to devices um, in your county? Absolutely. I think the internet access and device access was a huge benefit, especially at the very beginning. Uh, we were not a one-to-one -one district when all of this started. And so they were a critical piece of the puzzle for us. Um, and then, you know, now that we are one-to-one, -one, I still think the internet access will be um, a, a big need because we're in a rural area of Eastern North Carolina. And so even if the kids had the device, they may not have access at their house. So being able to go to a safe place to access the internet is going to be critical. Yeah, definitely. Have you found that hotspots 
are also being used as well in your county? Yes, we are using hotspots. We are using hotspots, but with the, and the hotspots have helped tremendously. But along with that, the same issue happens is that because we are so rural, there are areas that those hotspots don't work. So having the hotspot is you know not as beneficial as we would like in some places. So um, we still have gaps there, and until that is addressed statewide, um, we're going to need the support of our library systems for that. Yeah, absolutely. So our third question is for Amber, and this is what has been the most positive outcome of collaborating with local school districts? Good afternoon, everyone. I would say by far the most positive outcome of this collaboration has been it has strengthened our relationships. Um, we were in a very unique, unique position um, when this started um, pre-COVID. We had already um, been awarded a grant to start a homework help program. Um, so we had kind of had that loosely in place. And then once COVID hit, it was needed even more. Uh, we found once we got the word out to the local schools, they were huge support um, in helping um, getting the word out to their students, putting it on their Facebook pages, putting it up on their website. Um, teachers were great. I had guidance counselors calling me and say, hey, we heard you had this tutoring program starting in September. Is that still going? And it was wonderful to get those calls and to be able to offer those services to all the students in our counties. Um, they had the opportunity to sign up for a tutoring session and be able to get help with certified teacher tutors as well as our student volunteers. So they could bring their device. Some kids just needed access and we'd get them set up and they could go. Other kids, if they needed more help, we would, like I said, we would sit down one-on-one -on -one with them and help them work through that, their assignments. And that was, um, it really made you feel good at the end of the day to see them get to check off those little, boxes and complete those assignments. But yeah, I'd say that was a, um, a very um, wonderful partnership that's gonna continue because the kids did know then come in here, they could, if they needed a device, we could um, help them with that. Like I said, some of them just needed access and it gave them a safe place to come and get that access they needed. Thanks so much, Amber, for sharing that. I feel like the, um, library is sort of a safe space for students is really important. I know that um, after school, it can be a really good place for um, kind of catching up on homework and having a tutor there is kind of the added benefit of actually having somebody who's trained to help you with that. Um, our fourth question is for Tiffany. Um, what type of activities do you apply to story times um, and also the second question as a follow-up is what resources have you used to facilitate um, social and emotional learning during this time? So just as Paige was mentioning, um, virtual programming is like a hit or miss. And so it's a trial by error type system. Um, it was our first time ever exploring the virtual realm. And so we just started in February. And my first experience with virtual programming was with our Telemon Head Starts here in this county. So we have two of them. Um, they're split according to the school districts. Um, what I was able to do was I was able to align what they were already doing in their classrooms and just apply another level. As many other people have noted so far in our discussion, um, our parents and our students have experienced virtual burnout. So we had to do different creative things to just engage the students where we had challenges, where we even had, um, invited the students to wear shades, like have a shade themed story time. <laughs> um, we also did different things where we would make um, crab set bags to give to the kids. So if there was something that I was doing that week, if I was doing a lesson on butterflies, I would incorporate um, early elementary learning, such as counting and colors, as well as create a, cat, a craft kit that they could take home with them at school. And so even the kids that were watching remotely from school or at home could all follow along. Um, lead to the next question with uh, how we facilitate social emotional learning. Um, as we all know, it's been very challenging with the pandemic for our kids as well as our adults. So just, making sure we have in our collection different books, talking about emotions, talking about how we deal with situations and also relationship building skills and character traits. These are all things that should be at the core of our collection and just finding a way to implement that into story times. So what I often found was working with the preschoolers to kindergartners. 
finding board books based on how you feel and associating that with colors really help the kids understand, you know, we have these emotions, but there's a way that we cope with it and different activities that we can do. For instance, blue could be associated with being sad or gloomy. And some, um, what I also found too was some children, it was easier for them to align it or adapt it to weather. Like most of the time people feel sad when it's raining. And so I even have, you know, some children, they would say, well, I'm blue because it's raining. And so we would have to use different words and different, you know, phrases to explain what our, or define what our emotions was. But another key aspect was introducing different coping skills. When we would talk about anger, I could read a book about, you know, someone, a character being angry. And in this book, after we read the book together, we could talk about why did why was this character angry? What would you have done differently? And if the kids had no idea, which you know is normal, we could talk about different things like let's breathe in and out, let's take deep breaths, or even yoga poses. So different things like that was was extremely helpful, especially in collection development, because what I found was every time I decided to order any books, I would try to find books that really dealt with emotions, relationships, and how do children deal with different things like loss. Yeah, were there any particular resources like um, blogs or certain tools that helped you with that co collection development aspect? So with the tools I found, blogs, different blogs to be helpful too, um, because of the fact that I, in previous, previously before I became a librarian, I was a teacher, just finding those social emotional lessons, even online or different blogs was helpful for me. Um, finding how kids actually deal with anger and different situations or scenarios to actually help them role play was extremely helpful as well as puppets because sometimes you know you have to see it through another viewpoint so actually having kids um, explain the situation through play um, the one thing that has really taught me this past year has really taught me was um, just seeing how kids interplay with each other and head starters do a very good job of this because they have imaginary play stations and so with that kids can role play different things that they see go, like go on so using that to incorporate that with the theme book if I was talking about anger I could go ahead and say okay let's role play a situation where someone took your toy how would you go ahead about this how would you deal with it and let's use the puppets and they could actually act it out um, another thing was like, as I said before, yoga and the other additional resources to just to point to the parents and educators or nearby gyms or recreational facilities that that did possibly have, you know, things posted online, what you could do with your children to um, to pretty much help them channel their emotions in a positive way especially with children who were dealing with all these emotions, some of them would be angry. So one common or beneficial thing for them was pretty much to participate in recreational activities to help them channel that energy in a positive manner. Yeah, were you hosting these story times online or kind of in person or was it a mix? So majority of the story times we were doing was virtual and we're going to the next week or so finally do one in person. Nice. That's great. Um, I know as a former teacher as well, those blogs um, and resources for um, like lesson planning, it just kind of translates well into creating a story time as well. Um, so thank you so much, Tiffany, for sharing those tips. Um, the fifth question that we have, um, oh, there we go. Um, students have become disengaged um, specifically with reading in middle grades. Um, I know this is something that Lindsay kind of mentioned beforehand. Um, how can we reinforce a love for reading and an excitement for it? Um, this one is for Lindsay as well. 
Yes, I think this whole year, you know, our students have, you know, when being remote, they've really struggled for that connection. Our, you know, I think our teachers and staff have done a tremendous job of trying to create those connections, but students were just disengaged, especially in that middle and high school area, our age group. And so it's important that they find that love of reading and they, they've spent time reading the classroom content and they've not necessarily participated in reading for entertainment and to fulfill that love. So therefore, I think it's critical that we think about how can we use what we've learned to create new and exciting opportunities for students to foster that love. And um, I think the remote book clubs, the ideas of connecting with students, connecting the public library with our school and the activities going on within the schools to create those book clubs um, is a great way to spark that excitement. I think a remote, you know, having a remote option, you know, you can be face to face and you can also be remote, which will allow us to reach more students. A lot of times we have for example, in middle and high school, our student athletes, they often don't participate in things that are after school uh, because they're in those sports. Um, and that usually trumps a, a book club. So being able to provide that opportunity, they may would participate if they had the opportunity to sign in and respond to a discussion question maybe um, later in the evening. Or even our kids, I think Paige mentioned this, some of them that had medical issues that are at home and unable to be at school are homebound students. It would give them an opportunity to connect as well. So I think it would be interesting to see how we could create a combined face-to-face -face remote kind of book op club opportunity there for our students to create that excitement. I also think we need to think about how do we leverage the technology to connect with our students so that social media piece really comes into play. Like, could we conduct a Twitter book chat with our kids to create excitement or TikTok book reviews? Um, I like the idea of Discord and giving them a place to share and share the literature that they found and why they why they enjoyed it and what speaks to them and share their perspectives on that. Um, and then even, you know, Tiffany talking about story time, I think. Story time is so critical in the early grade, in the lower grades. That's what builds that love of reading. And we need to continue it on. As a former middle grades ELA teacher, I know my middle school kids love to read aloud um, themselves. It's a great way to start off a unit or a topic of study. So it would be great to be able to maybe do a Zoom in with the class and share that with them. So if our teachers are aware uh, of the story time opportunities and really create that connection virtually. I think when the kids were remote in a way, um, I heard some of you say that that, that kind of hit and miss on the virtual story time. I think when they were remote, it was easy for it to get missed. But if the teachers are tying it in together and able to have the kids ask questions of the person reading the read aloud together and really connect that way and kind of facilitate that, I think that would be really powerful in the lower grades as well as the middle grades. I think sometimes we think that they're too old for that, um, but they really do enjoy that. And I think it's a great way to address those social emotional learning issues that, that our students are dealing with and what they're facing. And it's just a way to give them a voice and to hear pers different perspectives and to share their thoughts. Um, all of the things Tiffany was saying about role playing and modeling, it's an opportunity to have those kind of conversations. I think that's a really good suggestion for um, bringing librarians and staff into the classroom as these sort of story time guests. I think traditionally, um, especially in middle and high school grades, the librarian might come in and then talk about databases and research um, and building those sort of skills. But actually, I think story times are really fun, no matter how old you are. Um, and I think parents know this too. <laughs> Um, so I think that's a really good approach um, and kind of saves on travel time if people are able to zoom in during a class. I think there's also a potential to, you know, to bridge the community in with the school, you know, that making yeah. those community connections and inviting guest speakers from the community to come in and do the read alouds and maybe they come to the library and are there um, and zooming in with the class. I think that would be really powerful. Yeah, definitely. And I think that kind of ties in well to some of the tools that were mentioned by Paige, like Discord, where you can kind of manage these interactions really um, in a responsible way. Um, our sixth question is, how do we support high school students during this time? Um, rec what recommendations do you have for developing a student access program? And this one is for Tiffany. To support high school students during this time, Lindsay touched on this. Building a rapport with the staff, the school administration. This is something that should also, that should always be constant and always flowing, like having that rapport and having that constant communication. 
What I found out is if you go into a school, just go and speak to the media coordinator. That's the first person you should go ahead and seek as the media coordinator and the administration. And then to the teachers that you see coming to your library systems, it's always helpful when you work a circulation desk or you work downstairs to see the staff or the local teachers come in and check out the books and see what type of material that they need. And always keep that line of communication open to ask them, you know, is there anything that they need to support their collections in their high schools? Um, another thing that has really helped is seeing what organizations they have in their class, like in their schools. Um, one organization I've, I've worked closely with has been Upward Bound, which is a federal program that offers um, offers help with students applying and applying to colleges and receiving scholarships. And most of these students are first generation. So just seeing what we have to offer as a public library to help them is a gateway into that, as Lindsay noted, um, especially when it comes to applying for scholarships. There's stuff already that we have as at our fingertips as a public library that many people don't know we have. For instance, we have Learning Express, which offers SAT and ACT prep tests for free. Um, they have up to four tests and even will offer a guide to help you, you know, revamp or revise anything that you have trouble with. You can go back and get remedial help and it'll go ahead and give you an explanation why you have the question wrong and what you can do to improve your score. So finding out this as well as the scholarship start search is very helpful for students um, in Upward Bound and talent search. And so they're constantly always looking for different ways that they can actually build partnerships within their county to support the growth of their students. Um, also think about FMLA. What are some things that we have as a library that can help, you know, clubs and organizations like FMLA or the Beta Club or National Honor Society. Another thing too that was mentioned was project-based learning. What can we do to support the teachers when it comes to project-based learning and research? Um, research is always going to be one of those type of subjects that you, you know, the more people that can help, <laughs> the better it is, because most of the time students have no idea where to even start off researching a paper, designing an outline, anything like that at all. So if you're willing to help a librarian or help an English teacher with that, or any teacher at all, they're extremely helpful, <laughs> extremely grateful. Um, so that's the first part. Um, the recommendations I would have to developing a student access program, after you set or establish a relationship with the school system, also to, like I said, see what they need and see what you have to offer and compare it at, like assess it. Um, a lot of our databases, if you look at them on a yearly, from a yearly time period, you'll notice that some of them, you may not experience any hits. Say to yourself, what is, what is it that's causing people not to access these systems? Sometimes it's because people simply don't know you have them. So working with the schools to let them know like, hey, I have stuff for research. I have stuff that can help you with project-based learning. I have stuff that can help even help you with, you know, high schoolers trying to find out what they want to do after high school. This is the type of conversations we can be having with our staff or with our um, student faculty and staff. Another thing too is just to compare what your IL ILS has to offer. If you could even um, upload student files to even make it easier for your school districts. Something that we did this past year, um, we were able to go with the second district to get in, get in the process of uploading student files so their students will have access to our like electronic resources. And so with that being said, they don't have to check anything out physically in our libraries, but they can do it all from home. So that's something that's been extremely helpful, especially with the pandemic and not knowing if the students were gonna be able to return to school even for that short period of time before you know testing. And so that's another key point. And the final thing is just making sure that your language is clear when you go ahead and finally promote your program. Um, that's something that we constantly work on and something that I'm going to have to be doing in the next come, you know, next few weeks because as we have, as the fall approaches quickly, because <laughs> this summer has already went by pretty fast. As the fall approaches, 
we want to make sure that parents and students understand what our program is, like what our program entails and what, what they'll have access to with all our resources. They'll have access to eBooks. We want them to know they'll also have access to computers if they need to come to the library at all. And hopefully as we move forward, they can have access to hotspots, stuff, like, stuff of that nature. And so it's just pretty much building the relationships, finding out what the school district needs are and seeing if that's something that we can help support them with. And if not, making, making it so that we can put it in our budget that we can. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really good point about kind of supplementing what they don't have with what you have the flexibility to purchase. Um, and thank you for plugging Learning Express Library and some of those other NC Live resources. You made a really good point about kind of tracking usage and um, all of our member libraries are able to do that on our website um, and really see those gaps and see, is it a promotion thing? Is it a training issue? Um, how can we bring it to them and make it easy for them to use? Um, and I think finding those career resources like Ferguson's or Learning Express Library, they really do make a difference for high schoolers who, you know, it makes sense if they're unsure. And especially after such a life-changing year as this one, you know, they might be reconsidering what their plans are or looking for new resources to figure out what is it that I want to do. Um, so thank you so much, Tiffany, for that response. We have question seven, which is, um, what balance do you strike between making the building safe for reopening without taking away puzzles, crafts, and other activities that make the library fun for families? Um, and this question's for Amber. Thank you. Um, just a brief um, background or about like orientation how we came to the COVID. We closed the public on March 17th, 2020. We reopened the public on June 1st, 2020. Um, however, as we were embarked on that reopening process, it was gradual. Um, we still had curbside service. We still even offer that for those who are, are, are in need. I would say is we were welcoming our families back. Um, we tried to make things, we wanted them to be able to come in and have fun, but we knew we couldn't have everything out. So it was like, what can we make? Like our grab and go kit, our craft kit, anything that we could put like in an individual bag or make for an individual group for like a family unit to use or um, a child to use, we would do that that way. Thinking about things pretty easy to clean, like our magnet tile. I think it, like puzzles were mentioned in the question. Anything that was very easy to clean, a child could use it. We could take it in, clean it, let it, um, and give it a, a time to dry for the next person to use. We could also find that during homework help, you have a cup of clean things and a cup of dirty things for like your pencils, your pens, your magic markers, all those different school supplies they needed. We started in homework help started mid September, so that was like a slow rollout with that. We um, had an in-person program back like October, like towards um, the beginning of October to mid-October. And we had different cushions for story time. So you, um, kids got to come in, they got to pick their favorite color of cushion. That was their spot. So then their family had their space. I pull up, pull up chairs around the cushion for those who didn't want to sit on the floor. And they had their own family unit, um, again, or um, group for story time. So that kind of helped keep everyone still practice social distancing, but social distancing, but get to do those fun things. Um, like even now, we are still have giving out lots of those grab and go kits. Some kids will use them in the library. Some kids take them home. Some of our patrons are um, happy to be back, want to be in the space and stage. Some come get what they need and they go, and that's okay too. Um, we're here to support them however they want. And that was, I would say, coming back, it was also a gradual process, but our families were comfortable to do. We didn't know what our story time numbers were going to look like. And we had small groups and that was okay because we had the people who were comfortable being in the building and that kept our numbers at capacity the way we needed to be. Um, but it, it was definitely a way of getting to see people come back and like we're learning and pulling out more and more things each and every day. Yeah, do you have any kind of lessons learned for um, quarantining and disinfecting materials from the last year? Um, that's a great question. It's like, I think I, we definitely, there's a lot of cleaning going on and that's okay. That's a good thing. Um, but yeah, you, um, it made me really aware of how much people touch things. Like you knew that in a public space <laughs> anyway, 
but now I'm like, oh gosh, don't touch that. I haven't cleaned it yet. Um, but no, it's just having as much as you can and really like if you can individually wrap things, individually package things. I don't know how many sandwich bags we've gone through and that's okay too, but just having those things and being prepared. Like, and it was great when I could say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't give you this, but I can offer you this. So I always had something else to give them if I couldn't give the child exactly what they asked for. Yeah, I think giving people options is just kind of a nice way to acknowledge that like whatever is comfortable for you, um, you you do what you need to. Um, I like the acknowledgement with in-person programming that you know numbers are going to be low, but that's okay because I think that there is this anxiety both in public libraries but also in academic libraries of uh, do I plan something for the fall? What is it going to look like? Are we going to have the people in the building that we had before we close down? And I think you know in reality it's okay. Like. <laughs> I think people will come back and the people who are comfortable um, have, you know, made the choice to be in person and that's, that's all right. So we have one final question before we kind of open it up to full Q&A. Um, and this one is for Paige. So study rooms have been really useful for facilitating online and hybrid learning. Um, what partnerships can be formed to increase space? Yeah, so Lindsay mentioned in the first one she answered about the teachers and the students coming to use the library uh, internet. And we, near the beginning of the pandemic, we got permission from, we're a county library, so permission from the county government to take the password off of all of our Wi-Fis. And that was a huge step. We also added some Wi-Fi access points on the outsides of the building so that even while we were closed, our parking lots were open to Wi-Fi and we advertise that fact that we put signs up and people were coming and sitting in their cars, sitting on the benches, sitting, um, you know, we had one, one family who would literally bring a table and camp chairs and set up in the front yard of the library here to use the Wi-Fi while we were closed. Um, and we live in one of those counties where if you're in town, you can get good Wi-Fi. If you're behind the mountains, you're out of luck. So there's places that can barely even get satellite internet. Um, so we were, we were a big part of that. Once we opened back up, our study rooms were being used a lot by people working from home, as well as um, families coming in to do stuff. The big test of that was the first day of school, which was all virtual, and there was no internet in any of the schools here in North County. So all of a sudden, we had teachers coming out of our ears trying to find a place to go to teach their classes. So we were stashing, especially here at the Valdez Library, in literally every room that we could shut a door in. Um, and we realized that we might be running out of space. And so we reached out and knowing the communities the way we do, we were able to you know, know who had internet and Wi-Fi in their buildings, who was open, who was not, who had spaces. Um, and so we worked with the rec department. We worked with churches. We worked with local businesses um, and, and other places like that to see who had internet. If it was inside or outside, did you have to have a password? Um, was there places people could go and shut the door? Um, big rooms, small rooms, depending on the family size. And so that helped a lot, having that information on hand in case people came in and we were unable to meet their need or we were full. We also did a short video of all the different spaces that we had available in the library. And that actually went over really well, showing the different sizes of spaces, you know, and the different configurations that could be set up in so people knew what was available. Um, as the year went on, the use of the rooms has, has dwindled, especially with the internet access um, being um, discounted or free. So if you could get it, you could get it fairly, fairly easily. Um, but we still have people coming in on a regular basis for tutoring, for online classes, even the summer for um, college classes. So it's been something that's, that's been used, used a lot. Yeah, and just a follow-up question for everyone. Um, it seems like broadband internet access is really the biggest pain point um, in kind of learning in the last year. And really it's not an issue that's gonna go away anytime soon. Um, have you found kind of partnering with school districts or other county agencies, has there been any sort of movement on um, increasing access or the infrastructure for it? Here, there's been a lot of talk about it, you know, and there are hot spots and everything, but the school system even was admitting very 
quickly that they knew there were areas that it was not going to work. You couldn't get, you know, this is a Verizon hotspot, but if you live in these areas of the county, you can't get Verizon service. So it's not going to work for you. Um, and they were suggesting that people come to us instead. Uh, I think that the very, very rural areas um, and areas that are cut off from easy access to stuff is an area, is, is something that is talked about, but nobody seems to have found a solution yet. I agree, Paige. I think we have, you know, it's a it's a huge concern, equitable access um, to internet. Um, I think there are a lot of different groups from what I hear that are looking at it and trying to figure out solutions for it. Um, a lot of the 5G satellites are going up around. Um, but at this time, we're next year, we're still going to face that challenge of being able to provide access to all of our students and families. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll continue to make progress in that area. But until there's broadband access from corner to corner, there's going to be that struggle. Yeah, definitely. Thank you um, all for sharing. We have um, a few questions that were submitted by attendees ahead of time in the registration form. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just submit the question in the chat and share it with you all. Um, and then we can kind of go one by one and giving a response. Um, and so the first question that we have is, how do we advocate for increased budgeting for emerging technologies that will help families and students get back on course with education? Um, so I figure we could start with Lindsay and then kind of go around to Tiffany and Amber and Paige, if that's all right. I think that's a great question. I think that's everybody's question. Um, and I think the partnership between the school system and the public library systems are going to be critical in that to share together the need for that to talk to, um, you know, our county commissioners and whatnot and to express the need for funding um, to help support those emerging technologies, you know, to, to make them aware of what the needs are and how they impact student learning and our community's growth and just making sure that we're singing the same song and sharing that um, as much as possible. And just to piggyback on what Lindsay's saying, um, just letting them be aware of all the resources that we have to offer the school systems too. Because there's so many, like I said, there's so many added on to our consortia. It's like, even when I check in on a weekly basis, I'm saying something different than what I did the week before. And just letting them know how it can benefit our students. Especially when you look at, you know, most of the counties now, um, they're one-to-one. -one. And so it's the fact they're spending so much of their money getting these, um, getting these devices, we should be able to help them with the electronic resources at least. So when something happens that a device breaks, they'll be able to replace it, hopefully. And so just letting, like Lindsay said, letting all the stakeholders know what's at stake and how we can help our kids is a revolving system that will benefit everyone else. Because as you know, if you invest in your children, they'll come back and they'll invest in the economy. They'll help you with your jobs. I mean, that's why plenty of like districts have homegrown scholarships. They want their students to return back to share some of the skills that they've learned when they went out in the workforce and other places are going off to college. You want that to come right back in return. So in a way, it'll benefit everybody just going ahead and investing in our students this way. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good point. I think the struggle with digital resources is that it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. And so mm -hmm. that is so critical is the sharing. You can never share it enough and share it with the teachers, share it with the school library, media coordinators, share it with the public, make sure, you know, there's never too much because they hear about it. All that's great, but the default's Google, you know, that just tends mm -hmm. to be the default and teachers, you know, to no fault of their own, but sometimes that's what they say. So the more we can share and spread what is out there, I just don't think you can share it enough. And I would just kind of taking a different approach. I completely agree with Tiffany and Lindsay, but also get the students and like the parents, the families to tell their story. I think one of my favorite quotes from one of our homework help surveys was when a mom said, we saved the mother-daughter relationship. Like it meant so much wow. to them that they could come into the library and have someone else to help them out. I had another, you know, 
he never gets his work done this fast at home. How did you get him to do that? You know, it's just like a different space and different people. So, you know, we're there to here to meet you where you are and whatever needs mm-hmm. you have. Yeah, I think the um, having those tutoring services definitely helps um, take the burden off of parents. Um, they're, you know, they can't be doing uh, everything at home on top of being their tutors and um, taking care of dinner and all of that. It's just like too much to ask. Um, so it's nice that your library has been able to provide that service and really meet them where they are. Paige, anything to add? Yeah, I was going to say, I agree with everything, especially, you know, working together so that we're not duplicating efforts. We're not, you know, not advertising and helping the other people with what they do have going. I think we need to look at the long road too. You know, it's awesome that there's the money now to buy this stuff, the grant to buy these hotspots to do things, but we don't want that to mask the fact that we do need to work, you know, work towards the broadband being expanded. We do have to look at long-term funding because these things don't last forever. Um, and so having those stories to back up the reason why we needed it um, and how we're using them every day in the schools and the libraries and the public, I think that's also important. Yeah, definitely. I think that um, as somebody who also taught um, in a North Carolina school district, um, we were one-to-one, but um, our grant was basically something that was put together and used in piecemeal. Um, And then the technology got out of date. And so then there was another grant to replace those computers and retrain everybody and bring them back to the students. And so, yeah, having that long-term plan and infrastructure um, on a state level would be really helpful. Um, Yeah, as Lindsay said, sustainability is a huge Mm -hmm. concern with that because, you know, there's updates that need to be made and, you know, whole infrastructure that needs to be put in place for this to be actually useful in the long term. And folks, please feel free to submit your questions in the chat. Um, I have one other question um, that I'll submit to the chat and share with you all. Um, How do you increase awareness in the community um, of bringing library services back in person and back into the building? And so we'll start with um, Tiffany this time and then kind of loop around to Amber, Paige, and then Lindsay. I would say just using your social media platforms. That's been the most useful thing. Just letting people know, hey, I'm here. We've even had like the funniest story. It happened actually yesterday. We had a family take a picture outside the library. They were posing outside the library. And so they were putting on their Facebook page saying, hey, we're back. And so just like, you know, them tagging us, letting us know, like, hey, we have these pictures in front of the library, let everybody know that you guys are open. Just using that, using your county websites or your county social media platforms to let us, let them know that we're here. Also, too, um, just all depending on how everything is, like your outreach, if, you know, what goodies you have for outreach, If you have anybody that's um, allowing people to come in and do like, you know, different professional developments or come in and just speak, just dropping different things, letting them know, like, you know, providing flyers, your social media platform information, and just letting them know, like, you know, these are our locations and we're opening at this time. So come on by. Just even say hi, just come on in because, you know, we miss you so much. And another thing we've done, we actually have like bags to give to our patrons as they're coming in so they can, you know, they can store their books. And so they have pretty much book bags that they have with our library locations up there. Those are all great things. And I 100% agree your social media platforms, your outreach, it's word of mouth in your community. Like, you know, Hey, it's so good to see you back. Make sure you tell your friends so we can get everybody back in here. But yeah, that is definitely help for sure. We, we realize over the last few years, we're really good at reaching the people we reach, the ones we don't reach that we're not sure how to get to. Um, and so we've spent the last you know six or eight months really brainstorming how to get more people. You know, our school system uses class dojo. So trying to get, you know, the principals and the media managers to dojo stuff out for us, reaching more people through social media by having different people share our posts has been a big help as well. We have a, you know, a regular, um, column in the local newspaper, as well as articles occasionally about stuff that's going on, but trying to get flyers up, trying to see 
where else can we go to get information out? Because if you don't already know we exist, we need to bring that to your attention mm -hmm. and make sure you know that we're still here and we're open for you. And I think another great way is, you know, all of those ways mentioned is just that partnership again with the school system. So having the schools share that information on their websites, their class dojos, like you mentioned, and the folders when we are back face-to-face -face, sending mm -hmm. home a flyer in the folder that gets home to parents. And even like open house nights, you know, with the beginning of schools coming up, setting up a booth at a, at a school, a local school to share your events that you have throughout the year might be a great way to reach some of those parents that may not be um, connected otherwise as they come through the schools to visit classrooms and whatnot. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good marketing opportunity. Um, and I think that, you know, from what we've all touched upon, there's definitely the folks who are social media users and love to share things and post and tag you in them. Um, and they get excited about that. But there's also the word of mouth and the flyers and all those personal touches that like reach a whole other set of the population um, and do make a difference. Um, thank you all so much for being a part of this panel um, and sharing your expertise with everyone here. Um, if we don't have any questions in the chat, um, what I'll do is just kind of end the recording. Um, and if folks want to stick around and individually ask uh, the panelists questions, that's all right as well. Um, 